One thing we have not done but need to point out is how skeptical scholars address the resurrection. In arguing for the resurrection, we have addressed three very general theories, which are often used by laymen. But to be fair, scholars do not usually use these theories, but usually try a blend of them, instead of just arguing one idea can explain the evidence. These are a little more sophisticated, so to be as fair as we possibly can, we'll take a look at two theories from scholars that have gained some traction. First, in his debate with William Lane Craig, Bart Ehrman put forward a theory he thinks is more probable of what happened after the death of Jesus. This is not his biggest objection to the resurrection, but this theory he put forward has made its rounds, so we should at least hear what he has to say and compare it with the evidence. The one thing we know about the Christians after the death of Jesus is that they turned to their scriptures to try and make sense of it. They had believed Jesus was the Messiah, but then he got crucified, and so he couldn't be the Messiah. No Christian, no Jew prior to Christianity thought that the Messiah was to be crucified. No Jew prior to Christianity thought that the Messiah was to be crucified. The, the Messiah would be a great warrior, or a great king, or a great judge. He used to be a figure of grandeur and power, not somebody who's squashed by the enemy like a mosquito. How could Jesus, the Messiah, have been killed as a common criminal? Christians turned to their scriptures to try and understand it, and they found passages that refer to the righteous one of God suffering death. But in these passages, such as Isaiah uh, 53, and Psalm 22, and Psalm 69, the one who is punished or who is killed is also vindicated by God. Christians came to believe their scriptures that Jesus was the righteous one and that God must have vindicated him. And so Christians came to think of Jesus as one who, even though he had been crucified, came to be exalted to heaven, much as Elijah and Enoch had in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. How then is Jesus the Messiah, though, if he's been exalted to heaven? Well, Jesus must be coming back soon to establish the kingdom. He wasn't an earthly messiah, he's a spiritual messiah. That's why the early Christians thought the end was coming right away in their own lifetime. That's why Paul taught that Christ was the first fruit of the resurrection. But if Jesus is exalted, he's no longer dead. And so Christians started circulating the story of his resurrection. It wasn't three days later they started circulating that story. It might have been a year later, maybe two years. Five years later, they didn't know when the stories had started. Nobody could go to the tomb to check. The body had decomposed. Believers who knew that he'd been raised from the dead started having visions of him. Others told stories about these visions of him, including Paul. Stories of these visions circulated. Some of them were actual visions like Paul. Others of them were stories of visions like the 500 who repeatedly saw him. On the basis of these stories, narratives were constructed and circulated, and eventually we got the Gospels of the New Testament written 30, 40, 50, 60 years later. So basically he says the disciples believed so strongly that Jesus was the Messiah, that upon his death they could not let go of it. So because of this belief in him, they still preached he was the Messiah, but was vindicated by God into heaven. And then they somehow started saying this also meant he was resurrected and was coming back soon to establish the Jewish messianic kingdom. He also explains away the empty tomb by saying Jesus' body had decomposed by the time the Christians started proclaiming the resurrection. So no one could check to see if the body was still there. Then people started having visions of Christ. Some were made up, but some, like the one Saul of Tarsus had, was real. And these visions constructed the narratives we have today. So the next question to ask is how does this theory compare to the evidence we have? Is it a better explanation of the evidence than the resurrection theory? Well, Ehrman's theory rests on the foundation that the origins of the resurrection belief stem from a simpler belief that Jesus was exalted to heaven, which also somehow meant he was resurrected. But as we've already shown, this doesn't add up. The Jews never expected or thought the saints who were exalted to heaven were somehow also resurrected and alive again. Resurrection was an event that would happen at the end of time to everyone at once. No one ever described a dead relative or a saint as having already been resurrected. Nor did the Christians use this language to talk of other dead saints, like John the Baptist or Elijah. Only they said this only happened to Jesus. On top of that, nor do the Christians describe the resurrection of Jesus like the general resurrection that is described in Daniel. 
Jesus is not shining like a star, as Daniel puts it, but it's described in a completely new way. So Ehrman's argument that the disciples stole this idea from their surrounding culture in the Old Testament is untenable and cannot explain the origins of the resurrection belief. It simply could not have come from their culture, as he postulates. On a side note, it can be debated if the Christians thought Jesus would come back in their lifetime, or if they were actually using Jewish apocalyptic language to describe a coming judgment on Jerusalem, which took place in 70 AD. As well as if in speaking of Jesus' return, he was going to come back to fulfill Jewish messianic expectations and establish the earthly ruling throne of David over Rome. The Christians clearly changed their beliefs into thinking Jesus was meant to establish a spiritual kingdom of love and mercy, in which Christ would work through the church to redeem creation. But neither of these are pieces of our evidence, so we'll move on. Ehrman tries to say the corpse of Jesus simply rotted away so no one could go and check. But this is untenable since the bones of Jesus would have remained, and people knew of the location of the tomb that was used. They would have known if a body was still there. Ehrman even admits during this debate that the women followers of Jesus watched from afar, so they knew where the body was and would have known if the tomb was empty or not. We also need to remember the tomb was in the Sanhedrin section of town, so the remains would have been in their presence, so they could have pulled them out at any time and provided witnesses to counteract the witnesses the tomb was empty. But we never see this as something the Christians needed to respond to. All the evidence indicates the tomb was found empty. This is also backed up even more by the fact that the evidence shows the tomb was found empty just three days later by women followers. The majority of scholars accept this because it meets the criteria of embarrassment, being that it was first discovered by women. No early Jew would make this up in such a male-centered culture. Because of this, most scholars accept this piece of data as authentic, and the tomb was found empty just three days later. Ehrman has, in other debates, said he thinks this could be just a mythic invention, and not rule out that it could have been invented. But this is ad hoc and hardly a response. As we have already discussed, the mythic theory cannot explain this. So Ehrman cannot explain the empty tomb as a later invention or decomposition. He also tries to say there was no early evidence the disciples suffered and died for their belief. But we did go over plenty of early and secular evidence. Paul mentions persecutions, Josephus says James was martyred, and Clement notes Peter and Paul were both martyred in Rome. So we do have evidence that at least some of the early witnesses suffered and died for their belief in the resurrection. He doesn't ever address how the gospel was proclaimed very early on in Jerusalem, where you would not go if the evidence was not in your favor. Tim McGrew tries to bring this up in his debate with him, but he doesn't seem to understand the issue, so we don't know how he would try to address this one. This brings us to the appearances themselves. As for Paul, who was a skeptic, he accepts Paul had to experience something which would cause his conversion, but he just says Paul had a vision which converted him. But as we have already demonstrated, this is untenable, since Paul would have been the least likely to convert or experience a hallucination of Jesus, so this is ad hoc. With the other appearances, he says some of them were made up, but some were real, so he tries to mix a hallucination and conspiracy theory. I don't know why he thinks the appearance of 500 can simply be dismissed as false. He agrees the creed in 1 Corinthians 15, which mentions this, is very early. He only seems to imply it could not happen because 500 people could not experience Jesus at once, which is arguing from a presupposition. If the only reason as to why it could not happen is because Jesus did not rise from the dead, then it simply is arguing in a circle and that doesn't actually refute the evidence. Sure, it is possible it was just an invention, but it would have been very hard for the Christian to make this up very early on without actually having the witnesses to back this up, unless they somehow managed to keep 500 people in on it. And again, if some people had visions in this Jewish culture where resurrection was not supposed to happen yet, these visions would only have implied a spiritual vindication to heaven, not a physical return to life. Plus, as we already went over, the appearances do not match typical signs of hallucinations. But we'll allow this one to tentatively pass, since it still is possible they were made up if this is the only fact we have to go on. But it hardly satisfies the other pieces of evidence, or provides overall explanatory power. However, to be fair, this quick explanation doesn't go in depth into defending these points, and it is not Ehrman's biggest objection to the resurrection. But this should be a lesson to skeptics who try to use this short clip to debunk the resurrection. It is not thorough and doesn't meet the evidence. A more detailed theory can be seen in what Gerd Ludemann gives in his book The Resurrection of Christ. Ludemann argues along the same lines as Ehrman, but gives us more details. Ludemann believes Peter suffered a terrible amount of grief and sorrow after the death of Christ, and was the first to hallucinate an appearance of Jesus. 
Through the power of suggestion, Peter was able to lead the remaining grief-stricken disciples into experiencing their own hallucinations with Peter. They then led a group of 500 in mass ecstasy that resulted in many of them partaking in the experience. James and his brothers were caught up in this mass ecstasy going on in Jerusalem. Later on, Paul was becoming disenchanted with the beliefs about God of Second Temple Judaism and secretly became attracted to the loving God of Christianity. According to Ludemann, Paul was suffering a mental war within himself. He wrestled against his subconscious but all-consuming needs for acceptance and self-importance and projected these onto Christians so as to justify attacking them all the most savagely. On his way to Damascus, Paul fled from his painful internal war into the safety of hallucinations. He came out believing God had called him to minister to the Gentiles as a Christian. However, because of his Jewish beliefs in final resurrection, he had to agree with the rest of the disciples. Their visions meant Jesus was physically resurrected. Later Christians to support the physical resurrection made up the empty tomb story. Narratives were constructed to combat Christians claiming Jesus was only symbolically resurrected, which became known to us as the Gospels. And according to Ludemann, this is how Christianity began. But already looking at this, we can see several problems that we have already addressed. First being that the empty tomb is a later myth that was added on. There is so much evidence for the tomb being empty, it is hard to dismiss. And we've already beat this enough. Ludemann surprisingly also thinks the discovery of the tomb by women was a later embellishment. But why? Such a fact was utterly embarrassing, and there was no reason to make it up. Ludemann accepts elsewhere certain facts were not made up because of how embarrassing they were like how Peter denied Jesus three times, or the early skepticism of James. If you can accept the gospel writers would not make up facts that were embarrassing or dishonorable, why would that not be the case here? So I don't see how the empty tomb could be a later invention, considering the evidence and embarrassment factor. Another issue is Ludemann is trying to psychoanalyze Paul. This is even hard to do by psychologists who have a subject in front of them. As Martin Hangel says, Ludemann does not recognize these limits on the historian. Here he gets into the realm of psychological explanations, for which no verification is really possible. Moreover, the sources are far too limited for such psychologizing analyses. There just isn't enough information to know if Paul was troubled by guilt before his conversion. All we have are letters from after his conversion, and there is no indication he was suffering from guilt and sin and projecting negative emotions onto Christians. On the contrary, we have more evidence Paul and Pharisees like him did not experience such struggles in standing against Christians. Swedish scholar Christer Stendhal says, Contrast Paul, a very happy and successful Jew, one who can, even when he thinks about it from his Christian perspective, say in his epistle to the Philippians, As to the righteousness under the law, I was blameless. That is what he says. He experiences no troubles, no problems, no qualms of conscience, no feelings of shortcomings. He is a star pupil, the student to get the $1,000 graduate scholarship in Gamalay's seminary. Nowhere in Paul's writings is there any indication that he had any difficulties in fulfilling what he, as a Jew, understood to be the requirements of the law. And Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona point out from what we know about Paul, he does not fit the profile of one who is likely to experience a conversion psychosis, as according to Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So there is no reason Paul would be a likely candidate to suffer some type of internal delusion. No evidence is given anywhere that he was in a troubled condition, and he doesn't fit the profile. And even if by some chance that he did, there is no reason it would cause a sudden conversion. This view about Paul is entirely ad hoc, implausible, lacks explanatory power, and is simply made out of thin air. The same can be said about James. As we said in the second video of this series, there is no reason the shameful execution and death of Jesus would suddenly convince his skeptical brother to proclaim him as Lord let alone get caught up in some group ecstasy of just 500. It is more likely the death of Jesus would only continue his unbelief. Ludemann also says the belief in physical resurrection stemmed from the disciples and Paul experiencing the hallucinations of Christ in the context of their culture. They thrust bodily resurrection onto their visions because that is the only way Jews could understand such appearances. But this is untenable for what the New Testament reports. The Christians claim to have visions of other people who had died and never once claimed they were physically resurrected. Christians in Acts told the servant girl that she had just seen an angel of Peter when she reported to see Peter at the gate. So they understood what visions were. So this shows they did not need to thrust bodily resurrection onto what happened to Jesus. They could have just interpreted it in the exact same way. In fact, no one from that time period would thrust bodily resurrection onto a vision 
because the Jews did not expect such a thing to happen until the end of time. Only the Christians said this only happened to Jesus, which actually doesn't fit the culture. But Ludemann also has to admit bodily resurrection was the earliest belief of Christians, so his theory cannot explain the origins of the resurrection belief. Because of this, the assumption the disciples were in a condition to hallucinate a physical resurrection is lacking. Even if Peter was grief-stricken and convinced the others to partake in his hallucination, there would be little reason to think all would hallucinate and experience the same thing, let alone infer a physical resurrection. Group hallucinations are exceptionally rare, and are supposed to vary in what is reported, and where he already dealt with the psychology before and demonstrated the appearances do not match the conditions of what would be required for group hallucinations. So the same conditions apply as before. As Dale Allison says, one person can hallucinate, but 12 at the same time, and dozens over an extended period of time? These are legitimate questions, and waving a magic wand of mass hysteria will not make them vanish. So, as we've already explained, hallucinations cannot explain these appearances without lacking plausibility. I will also point out the same conditions of the hallucination theory apply for Ludemann's theory for the rest of these facts, since his basic argument regarding the appearances would be they were caused by hallucinations and mass hysteria. So we can apply the same logic we already went over, and I'll refer people to that previous video for more on that. But since that is the case, skeptical theories like this that blend different possibilities failed offering a satisfying explanation of the facts. If the basic theories themselves cannot explain the evidence, mixing them will not do much better. Perhaps the real problem is Ludemann and other skeptics who attempt this are always implying that if they can propose a naturalistic theory with an ounce of plausibility, it automatically trumps the resurrection theory. But presupposing naturalism is probably true doesn't show your proposal makes fewer assumptions or can explain the data without being ad hoc or implausible. One should remember methodological neutrality and not let their historical horizon force them to take a theory that is more ad hoc just because it conforms to their preconceived worldview. A little more is needed. Of course, there are plenty of other theories proposed by skeptical scholars, but they all fail for similar problems. Scholar Mike Lacona deals with several in his book The Resurrection of Jesus, but none of them can really offer a satisfying theory to explain such radical changes. Some events would need to happen which could give the disciples a new perspective. Very few theories come close, and only one can satisfy all the data.